We present Genius, a replacement bus service operates between clever and stupid. Here is your host, Dave Gorman. Hello, I'm Dave Gorman and welcome to Genius, the show all about your ideas. Every week, myself and a celebrity guest stress test and examine various inventions, plots and plans in the hope that we will unearth some top-of-the-range, copper-bottomed genius. These ideas are sent to us in their thousands by you, the Radio 4 listeners, some having obvious potential for the show, some requiring further investigation by the team, and some, well, some requiring further investigation by the police. (laughs) For example, this week we received this anonymous letter. Dear Genius... I think This Is Your Life has always been a tawdry programme focusing on people who, while in the public eye, are far from completing their life's achievements. My genius idea is to force This Is Your Life to instead focus only on dead people. (laughs) It could be called This Is Your Wake. (laughs) The first person they feature could be Darren Day. (laughs) Of course, an idea like that is never going to make it onto the show, I'm sorry, we just don't take anonymous submissions. (laughs) However, to discuss the merits of the ideas submitted this evening, none of which are thinly veiled death threats aimed at shallow entertainers come love rats, we obviously need a guest who possesses genius himself. And I'm pleased to say we have just that. Comedian, writer, artist, clown, for proof of his genius, I would direct you to his radio show, Simon Munnery's Experimental Half Hour, which is so experimental, it lasts an hour. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, the genius that is, Simon Munnery. Good evening. (laughs) Or is that overstepping the mark? (laughs) It's a strange thing when you say... Good evening. It's tentative, isn't it? Somewhere somewhere between a wish and an observation. I I don't actually like the word genius very much. (laughs) You you seem to have changed the meaning slightly. Almost like an adjective rather than a noun. Deliberately. Presumably. Well, we've, we've diluted it so that it means nothing anymore, obviously. Yeah. Um, <laughs> moving on. Um, <laughs> let's Ooh. see how, how the ideas presented this evening hold up. Uh, we're going to hear a selection of ideas, and we need you, Simon, to decide uh, whether or not you think they are possessed of genius. At the end of the show, our audience will then decide which of your two favourites is the toppermost, and that idea will win for its creator uh, the coveted genius trophy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Who wouldn't want to get their hands on a trophy like this? Except maybe a metalsmith. Um, So we'll get the ball rolling with our first potential genius, who is Dan Heaver of Shepherd's Bush. Dear genius, shaving product companies are constantly bringing out new razors with even more blades. My idea is to take this to its logical conclusion. It would work like this. A mould is taken of the customer's face with the beard growth area lined with razors. (laughs) and all the customer has to do is lather up in the morning place his face in the mould and nod okay Dan um, you and I both wear beards Uh, (laughs) Simon doesn't Uh, so I guess you're more likely Simon to be interested in in this idea if it took off no I'm not interested I think you're trying to kill me (laughs) I, uh, uh, you and I, Dave, surely have less time in the morning. Well, no, I, if this is about saving time, yeah. then having a beard saves even more time. <laughs> I, I, I would use this because then the time that I've saved would be saved with a full face razor. <laughs> so, so you're actually saying the only reason that you actually you wear a beard today is it's because, because this does, this does not, not exist. exist. Yeah, that's right. OK. <laughs> you're wet. You're wearing a beard as a kind of protest <laughs> against the non-existence of something. Wouldn't, wouldn't the, the, the time you saved by using this be spent visiting A&E? <laughs> this is a bespoke product. This is a, this is, this is a luxury product. Yes. You know, and so, so, you know, if you go to Savile Row, you have a suit, it's a bespoke suit, and it's the finest quality. Obviously, these razors, they would only cut in a certain way, very gentle Loving way. And it, it is specifically contoured to your face? To your face only, of course, yes. Mm. Uh, you say nod. 
Right, so you've got your face in a claustrophobic cabinet full of blades. Now, I mean, what, what you need is it for somehow the, 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 the structure to revolve around your face. I mean, nodding, you're just going to dig the blades in, aren't you? In some directions. No, some, no, because... some places it would shave perfectly, other places it, the blade would cut your throat. <laughs> we, we can test this. We, we've tried to build a prototype. Um, <laughs> it's a fairly large cheese grater. <laughs> if I just judge your face correctly, we'll just... A little more in at the chin, I think. <laughs> there you go. How, is that... <laughs> is that the kind of manufacturing process you were, you were, you were thinking of? Possibly not. <laughs> I don't think that counts as bespoke. <laughs> Are you a bandage salesman on the make? <laughs> is that what this is about, really? I feel like you're not grasping the, the quality of people who can make things in this country, you know? There were some, some very talented razor makers. I mean, even if you got the technology completely right, even if they could make a mask that contoured to your face and just took off your hair and didn't touch your skin, you would then spend the rest of your life frightened of putting on weight. No, 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 but you see, this is, this is the commercial advantage of it, you see, so it's bespoke. So you put on a little weight, you need another razor. But you don't know that you need another razor until you put on a bit of weight that you didn't know about. Mm. But you cut yourself with razors, and you, it cuts you, and you think, I need a new razor. Yeah, but that's, that's being cut by one razor. <laughs> Once. I don't know. The, the, the hands-free element of it appeals to me. <laughs> the face-free element doesn't. Um, <laughs> But it isn't my choice. Uh, it is Simon's choice. Uh, Simon, Dan Heaver, the full-face male bespoke razor. Is that genius or is it not genius? I, I think it's genius, but evil genius. <laughs> evil genius is allowed. That counts. Yeah. Well done, you. Well, our next idea has travelled from South Woodford, London, in the brain of Suzanne Cranshaw. Dear genius, just like guide dogs for the blind, how about talking parrots for people who can't speak? <laughs> Simon, how do you feel this would work as an animal-human interaction? OK, so someone, someone can't speak. Yes. They have a parrot that speaks on, on their behalf. Correct. Then there's the problem of how you control the parrot to say what you want. Because <laughs> you can't speak to it to tell it. There would have to be training involved, yes, as so there is for guide dogs for the blind. Yes. <laughs> so but but, but a guide view. dog is trained to, I don't know, they recognise traffic and not walk you into the middle of the road. Yes. A parrot needs to be taught to know when you want some stamps <laughs> and when you want a pint of milk. And the, that's the bit I'm confused over. I mean, yeah. if it went wrong, the parrot was to malfunction. <laughs> you know, you could, you could end up walking into the bar and saying to the barmaid, I love you. Yes. And then going home and saying to your wife, may I have a pint, please? <laughs> Actually, I've done that. <laughs> um, without a parrot. So I, I still see a lot of people suddenly wanting pumpkin seeds. <laughs> I was thinking that these parrots could branch out, maybe not just for people who can't speak, but maybe for, you know, shy people who aren't confident in pubs meeting Or people suffering ladies. from ennui, just bored at parties. Yes. You, know, you could have the parrot train go, my name is Kevin, I work in computers. Exactly. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> I'm not sure that the people who are, uh, are shy are going to want to walk into the pub <laughs> with a parrot. <laughs> 
think I'd actually just solved the problem as well of how you communicate with the, the parrot. So say you're going to the post office and you want to get a book of first-class stamps. You walk in with the parrot and you've got a notepad and you write down book of first-class stamps and you show it to the parrot <laughs> and the parrot says it. And if it doesn't say it, you just show the notepad to the person behind the counter. <laughs> there you go. And then they give you the first-class stamps. And that would work... It works either way. ..with or without <laughs> the parrot. <laughs> we, we did try. I mean, there, there is one person, we thought, the most famous person in British life who is unable to speak for themselves. Um, and they have quite complex things to say. This is just a, a little e- extract. Black holes send out particles and radiation at a steady rate. This causes a black hole to evaporate slowly. OK, now that's Stephen Hawking saying something you know, quite complex that we weren't sure a parrot would cope with. Um, and, and so we've had a parrot listening to that um, for about a month to see if it could learn enough so that it could actually, you know, operate on behalf of uh, Stephen Hawking. And after a month, this is what it came up with. Ah, who's a pretty boy, then? You see, uh, it's, do you see the limitations there? Yeah, I see what you're getting at, Dave. Um, maybe I didn't think it through properly. No, I mean, because we, we then played that parrot... Um, to Stephen Hawking for a month. <laughs> and he came up with... Who's a pretty boy, then? You see, so, um, <laughs> it does feel to me that technology has already sort of solved the problem that yeah. parrots would struggle to solve. Fair enough. I was just trying to save the rainforests here. <laughs> S- save the rainforests? <laughs> by taking the parrots out of them. <laughs> I, I think you'll find the danger isn't the parrots. <laughs> <laughs> Very not promised. But... You, you look as if you know which way it's going, Suzanne, but uh, yeah. don't give up until the verdict is in. Okay. Simon, is Suzanne with her talking parrots genius or not? Genius, completely not. <laughs> no, no. Unlucky, oh. Suzanne. Oh, You're not a genius, but we thank you for coming all the same. OK, well, our next idea hails from Hemel Hempstead and is brought to us by Ewan Slater. Dear Genius, instead of telephone numbers being based on geography, as with landlines, they should be based on psychological analysis. <laughs> this way, similar people would have similar phone numbers, which would mean that if you dialed a wrong number, at least you would be talking to someone who was quite like the person you were trying to call <laughs> anyway. Also, if someone gives you their phone number, you would know if you were compatible just by reading it. And if you split up with your partner, you could just phone people with similar numbers to try and arrange a date. So your telephone number somehow represents your personality. How, How many digits are you thinking... Does it matter? Or to you, maybe. <laughs> uh, basically, so the phone numbers tell you something about the personality. Agreed, okay. yes. I'm worried about the idea that you know immediately whether someone is compatible with you or not. Because I just think if that was the case, I would never have had a relationship in my life. It's the, <laughs> it's the minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years of discovering that you don't actually like someone <laughs> that, it, it, that makes up all of my relationships. <laughs> But even if you had their, their psychological number, if you had their number, how would you then know whether they were compatible or not? Do you think it could all be worked out from, that's your number, that's someone else's number, we can, but we can decide whether they're compatible just by looking at those two numbers? In which case, doesn't it reduce everything just to number? Well, I mean, if I can respond to those two points oh. separately. <laughs> um, it's good. In the first case, I think Dave sounds like a little bit of a social masochist. I'm, I'm sorry, but in terms of your love life, if the only point of having a relationship is to spend years discovering that you hate someone... Oh, no, no, I'm not saying that's the only point. point. <laughs> I, I, I would love to discover that I actually really like someone, uh, but the fact that I'm single uh, at this moment in time shows that every relationship I have embarked upon has floundered on the rocks, but it doesn't mean I didn't enjoy the journey towards those rocks. Yeah, but... <laughs> I've got a relationship and we we built it on the rocks to save time. (laughs) 
Well, for both of you gentlemen, this system applies just as well. You can just go and look for people. You look at their numbers, you know that you're going to hate them, and then ask them out on a date. Why not? <laughs> I was walking down Tottenham Court Road the other day and uh, passed a Scientologist. And for the first time, I thought, you know, I will have a look at that personality test because I thought it might be instructive uh, to this evening. There are basically 200 questions. Mm. So if you use that as the model uh, with those 200 variables and they all have a yes-no answer, that leaves you with 1.6 million, 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 million permutations of how that could be filled in, which would be actually 61 digits for every phone number. Yeah, but, I mean, if you've ever sat on a bus behind a bunch of teenage kids who are texting, I really don't think they're going to have a problem. And I think (laughs) for the older ones amongst us, it might be useful in terms of improving our manual dexterity and our memory. Keep us fit. Yeah. Incidentally, I wouldn't recommend anyone filling out this questionnaire because I filled it out and it came back telling me that apparently I would really like to see Mission Impossible 4. Um, (laughs) No idea how that happened. Um, Simon, are we staring in the face of genius here? If, if it could be done, but I don't believe it's possible to map out someone's But, I mean, that, that, that's just you not, you know, following through. You're just not getting the vision thing. I mean, if people had said the first time they proposed Concord or spaceflight, no, it can't be done, not doing it. No, never flying to the moon. We'd never have flown to the moon. Columbus, no, I, you so, know. I think I've said well, yes, then. <laughs> There you go, Ewan. I think it's the first time anyone has ever bartered with the guest. <laughs> OK, well, let's see if our next idea can persuade you also. It comes from Martin Jeffries, who is from Bath. Dear genius, I'm a crabby old man with an allotment. <laughs> I enjoy working my plot as it gives me time to ruminate and sometimes as I dig my rather heavy clay soil, my thoughts turn to all those energetic young people who are probably at the same time as I'm digging, trying to get fit by pounding away at strange machines in stuffy gymnasiums. My idea, therefore, is to rent out my specialist equipment for a modest additional sum, provide ample ground for them to, uh, to be used on. And a, a few hours working on my plot should work wonders for their fitness. Um, OK. Um... Your idea, Martin, is that people should pay you to come and work on your allotment. Ah, yeah, but think what they buy. They pay for my special equipment. A spade, (laughs) a fork, a rake. That's included in the cost. I mean, they they pay out enormous amounts for for the various machines that they use. Yeah, OK. I'll I'll just point out Simon. And they also get the expertise, of course, of my uh, long experience in digging uh, my allotment. (laughs) (laughs) An experience you seem quite keen on giving up. Uh, um, How does this strike you? Uh, A big yes. (laughs) Uh, uh, Yes. Um, How insane. People drive to the gym. Exactly. Why why, why not walk to the gym? And then when you get there, you've had your exercise, you go home. What a lucky man you are to have an allotment. Exactly. Allotments yes. for all. My, my mum's got an allotment, and um, yeah, I, I often watch her work on it. I'm impressed that you... <laughs> I'm impressed that you grasped the idea so quickly. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm digging. The, other, the only thing is, though, what tends to happen on allotments, you see, it tends to be older people. As you get older, you suddenly realise... Oh, oh, not these days, but anyway, go on. Really? Right. The, 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 <laughs> children working in yours. <laughs> <laughs> my, my understanding of a gym... Uh, having not really been to one, is that there is specific machinery designed to work on specific muscle groups. Yes. Yeah. Uh, now, exactly. whereas on the allotment, yes. it's more no, 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 what no. needs no, doing on the, today. On the allotment, you, you employ a, a number of physical skills. Digging and raking and hoeing, they're all totally different. They all exercise different well, parts of the body. Aren't they all back-breaking? <laughs> yes. We sent a sound engineer last week to both a gym and an allotment to see if, if there was any kind of way of, of fusing the two in, in one experience. And, and basically, this is kind of what gyms sound like. That's enough of that. And, um, and on the allotment, it was basically a test match special. 
<laughs> that, that was what it sounded like there. It was partnership now worth 87 between these two. Square cover, extra cover, mid off. Mid-off. Okay, now, now uh, we thought basically those two things are, are clearly completely incompatible. Yes, indeed. Uh, but apparently, turns out they're not. Partnership now worth 87 between these two. Square cover, extra cover, mid off, mid on. Deep square leg and the long leg for Bravo now to Cook. And Cook is right forward defensive and up on the offside. Good, solid defensive shot. Bat and bat locked together. Head over the ball. Kind of a replay you would show. Uh, and on that basis, <laughs> I think there might be something in this idea. Those, it seems to actually fuse. It's possible. I'm getting a good feeling for you, Martin. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to go for the verdict, Simon. Oh, yes. Genius? Yes. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> well done, Martin Jeffers, the back. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our final idea this evening comes from Lavinia Murray of Bollington near Macclesfield. Dear genius, my idea is a vacuum cleaner that spins a thread from all the fibres and dust it collects and winds it on a reel ready to use. A more expensive model would have a loom attached to weave the thread. You could choose the item you wanted. For example, trousers, hat, cushion covers. And when there was enough thread to complete the item, it would be automatically delivered to the collection area. So essentially it's it's clothes made out of the detritus that a vacuum cleaner... Yes, it is. Um, I've done some further research since I sent the idea in. Most of what is shed in a house is actually skin. Um, So it's actually, um, if you bear with me, it's actually going to be a cruelty-free woven leather. Is it technically cannibalism? No, no, actually, that works in its favour because... What you do is, of course, you know who's coming to your house, you hoover up after they've been, and you can actually say 20% uh, Cousin Nigel, 40% Auntie Mabel, and, of course, you're personalising an item in a world that's just full of non-personal items. It seems a really good idea to me. You'd be able to look at different patches and go, oh, that was... who was there. Absolutely. Where they sat on the sofa and... Yes. Oh, of course, we had mice, didn't we? Yes. Um, have, you, have you brought any samples of, of garments that you've I'm made? I'm wearing them. You're wearing them? <laughs> well, because we've built a prototype of this machine ourselves. Now, for delicate patent reasons, I'm not actually allowed to show people the vacuum cleaner loom that we've built because we don't want anyone to steal the idea in, in case it turns out to be a goer. <laughs> Looking at your clothes today, I would say that ours is not as sophisticated a machine mm. as the one you, you, you've worked on. Um, we know, we know we're a few bits of fluff away from a jacket being produced. Um, so if I just turn it on... <laughs> OK. And, yeah, the jacket's there. <laughs> it's... I've seen things like that on, on models from Vivian Westwood. I mean, it looks terrific to me. Yes, and you know what? The next day, they all die. Because <laughs> I'm breathing in this jacket now, and I'm telling you, it doesn't make me feel very happy. Um, I am actually holding up a jacket, which is genuinely made from the residue from the BBC vacuum cleaners. Um, Well, that's the BBC, isn't it? I mean, (laughs) Yes, it is. Um, (laughs) Basically, it's a sort of, I don't know, a sort of grey, filthy, (laughs) cigarette and bus ticket infested piece of horror, basically. Um, (laughs) That was the sound of me putting the jacket down. (laughs) and the audience reacting. <laughs> would, would anyone like to wear it? <laughs> you actually put your seriously volunteering. Would you like... Well, let's just see how it looks on a <laughs> person. Um, I think you wear a dust mask. There you go. And now... Oh. Whatever 
you do, don't move a muscle. <laughs> it's truly revolting. Um, it, it could be seen as a fashion statement. I mean, it really could. It's a fashion statement that says, it's... leave me alone. <laughs> no one would mug you. <laughs> um, what's, what's your name? Steve. I don't think health and safety would allow you to take the jacket away, so um, as stillly as you can. <laughs> I'm going to try and remove this from your shoulders. Seriously, don't move, because I don't want to get a mouthful of this stuff. <laughs> OK. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. I have to say, Lavinia, earlier this afternoon when I saw our prototype, I wasn't persuaded. <laughs> Seeing the clothes you're wearing, it brings me to the idea far more. Simon, how do you feel? Yes. <laughs> Lavinia, you are a genius. Well, Simon, we need to know your two favourites so that we can choose who uh, goes home with this trophy. The gym allotment and the vacuum loom. I need to ask uh, Martin Jeffries and Lavinia Murray to join me on the highly polluted stage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for joining me. Ladies and gentlemen, by applause, all those in favour of the Martin Jeffries Gym Allotment Scheme. <laughs> and all those in favour of the vacuum loom. <laughs> thank you for coming, sir. We thank you. You're a genius, but you're not a trophy-winning genius. Lavinia. You are tonight's trophy-winning genius. How does that make you feel? I'm flabbergasted, and my asthma's coming on because of the dust. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've only got yourself to blame. Yes, um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Glenn Gentleman, Lavinium. <laughs> we thank you very much, Lavinia, for gracing us with such a genius idea. I'd also like to thank Simon Munry for being a genius guest. <laughs> Everyone who pitched their ideas, genius or not... And, of course, you for listening. But we just have time for a few suggestions from tonight's studio audience, which include a secret handshake for all non-Masons, <laughs> that all foodstuffs should follow the lead of Turkish and Angel Delight and name themselves after the group they would most delight, <laughs> and that we set off on an expedition to Mount Lisa Snowden. <laughs> Good night. Genius was hosted by Dave Gorman with special guest Simon Munnery. It was devised by Ali Crockett and David Scott. The producer was Simon Nicholl.